The UK Chancellor has unveiled a new budget to tackle soaring inflation and the cost of living crisis. But will his plan work? It's supposed to fill a 54 billion pound black hole in the UK government budget. In this edition of the Spotlight, we will look at that budget, which is called austerity by many uh, uh, circumstances, see if it is feasible or just projection based, and also whether the Chancellor's much dreaded austerity program will help UK's economy, which is projected to face the worst recession on record. First, let me introduce our guest for this edition of the Spotlight. Former member of the British Parliament, Lembit Opik, joins us from London. Also joining us is journalist, author, and activist, Fra Hughes, who joins us from Belfast. All right, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Uh, let me first start with you, Lembit Opik, if I may. We are taking a look at a budget that uh, right off the bat has been called an austerity budget and taking a look at the definition of uh, what austerity is. It fits all of it, policies that are considered um, an increase in taxes, cutting back on government programs like health care services, aid to veterans, maybe a reduction in pensions, reduction in salaries, although the reduction in pensions is not mentioned. Why is it called an austerity package, you think? Uh, because it's a familiar phrase, but what you could call it is a disaster package. When it comes down to it, uh, when you have an overheating economy, you increase taxes and you increase uh, inflation rates, sorry, you increase things to reduce inflation, uh, but you also increase uh, things like interest rates. If you have a weak economy, then you reduce those things. This uh, budget is neither. We've got a situation now where we've got a two trillion pound economy with roughly a two trillion pound deficit. But the fundamental problem here is, as far as I can see, that Rishi Sunak has to put right what successive governments have done wrong for many years. What does this mean in practical terms and not economic terms? The poor will pay much more in their taxes. The rich will as well, but they can afford it. So we live in a situation now where the United Kingdom, the sixth biggest economy in the world, is punishing the poor for the mistakes of politicians. And that's something I would never have voted for when I was an MP. So uh, are we looking at the party itself to have failed uh, successive economic policies, perhaps, Fra Hughes? I mean, this one in particular, um, couldn't say it better based on a headline that said just about everyone is going to pay more taxes, uh, tax, tax rises for all. Uh, looking at 55 billion pound belt tightening measures uh, due to these tax rises. Is that an accurate description? I think it is, yes, 100%. Uh, I think for a lot of people to hear the word, you know, everyone knows what tax raises actually mean, more money taken out from the public, from uh, people's disposable income after they've paid for everything else, their mortgage, their housing rent, their food, their fuel. Uh, and austerity is just a word that people like vaguely know stuff about. So in order to kind of see if this is an austerity budget and where it's going to take us in the, in the future, I just uh, took the liberty of writing down a few notes from a book that was written on a Tory austerity. Uh, it's called The Lost Decade and it covers the years 2010 to 2020. Now, apparently there are more uh, food banks in Britain than there are McDonald's. 600,000 children have fallen back into relative poverty life expectancy has shortened one in five girls and young women are cutting burning or poisoning themselves infant mortality rates have risen for the first time in two generations the public realm uh, is employing a smaller proportion of the workforce than it has done since 1945 25 percent of all local government jobs no longer exist two-thirds of children in poverty have at least one parent working. Theresa May said in 2018 austerity had ended, yet in real terms uh, job salaries for many have remained stagnant for over a decade. Nurses, firemen, postal workers and rail workers are either on strike or about to go on strike. And while many European governments have uh, renationalized the uh, energy companies, what Britain declared yesterday was that they were going to spend 5.8 billion pounds building more ships. So what we have is a further uh, removal of wealth from the poor to the rich through this agenda. And it proves that uh, Rishi Sunak, the present British Prime Minister, when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, 
Uh, his assets and those of his wife and his family were supposed to be more than uh, 700 million pounds, which was more than the 600 million that uh, the Queen was supposed to have had uh, uh, as her kind of disposable income or money right. that she could uh, reach as an asset. So uh, Rishi Sunni's wife hasn't paid any tax. These people are so removed from the public domain that they have absolutely nothing in common with the poor of Britain. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think I heard uh, uh, what you said after all the statistics because I was really just uh, drowning, drowning in that. No, 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 I did hear you, but I, I was so drowned okay. into the severity and the shock factor of some of the uh, points that you made there, which I'm tempted to ask you this question, Lempidopic, that the Conservatives should not even be... Uh, up for uh, voting. They should be eliminated if that's the type of uh, uh, output is, uh, is coming out of the UK economy. Um, are we looking at uh, failed economic policies from the Conservative Party or is it, is it more to the story as if, in, if there was somebody else that was uh, heading the ship, they would still fall flat like they did? You asked me three questions. First of all, the Conservatives have completely messed up with the economy, which is the one thing that people used to vote for uh, when they voted Conservative. Secondly, yes, successive governments have done that. This is the irony. Uh, the Labour Party and the Conservatives both made similar mistakes leading to this meltdown. Uh, remember the, that the uh, 2008 meltdown was really under the uh, leadership of uh, the Labour Party. They didn't cause the global recession, but they did not protect against it. Thirdly, the biggest question that you ask, can anyone do better? Not at the moment, because Keir Starmer has no better solution than Rishi Sunak. At least, uh, whether you like him or you don't like him, uh, Jeremy Hunt is talking about these terribly difficult decisions. I would actually take a different economic philosophy. I studied economics at university. I was top of my class at school on this. So maybe I've got some qualification to talk about this. But Keir Starmer is not in any way credible. His position about creating a net zero uh, national grid for electricity by 2030 is just ludicrous. Um, he doesn't explain how he does anything. He doesn't really tell the rich or the poor what he's going to do about tax. So wherever you stand on the climate, wherever you stand on tax, nobody knows what Keir Starmer will do. And I suspect if he had a good story to tell, he'd tell it. So that's, I think they don't have a clear cut plan, do they? Uh, limit no. open in, in terms of what to do at this point. Um, let me ask you, for he's the spokesperson. Um, Rachel Reeves said the government has forced our economy into a doom loop where low growth leads to higher taxes, lower investments, and squeezed wages with the running down of public services, all of which hits economic growth again. So that's what uh, she has said. Uh, your reaction to that, if you agree, and of course the fact that as I uh, asked Lampet Opec, they don't have a clear-cut economic plan to present instead of what's being presented out there by Jeremy Hunt. Well, I do agree with what Rachel has said. Uh, maybe what I would add to it is, that, you know, it, it may be a vicious circle, but it could be broken at any time because I am a strong believer in the redistribution of wealth, and that is the part of the problem here, that there is no fair distribution of wealth within the United Kingdom. I believe if tax avoidance was ended, that the national debt could be, could be wiped out uh, practically overnight. One third of the billionaires in Britain have their money in tax havens and pay absolutely no tax. Many corporations do exactly the same. They avoid paying their tax, which is actually stealing uh, public services from the people who are most in need. I, I don't believe that uh, successive British governments have uh, failed politically or their policies have not brought about the economic boom that they came to want for the people on the island of Britain. I believe that successively from market thatcher on, they moved to privatise all the public utilities. They moved on to uh, create wealth for for companies at the expense of their workers. And then what we had after the crash and after 2010 was there was nothing else to privatize, there was nothing else to give away. So then they brought in austerity, which I believe the Tory government, every time it gets into power, wants to reduce public spending. It wants to send the people back into the Victorian age of the workhouse. And that's why we have food banks. That's why we have more children in poverty than ever before. 
And that's why mental health, uh, homelessness, drug abuse, uh, violence on the streets and crime are all skyrocketing because the government has taken away the safety net and the mental health security for the nation and have basically abandoned the people in order to uh, finance the rich and to continue with the uh, war effort with these new ships at the £5.8 billion pounds that they're about to spend, which could be spent on the health service, could be spent in welfare payments and could be spent creating housing and employment for the people of Britain. When you, when you talk about the redistribution of wealth, that's a very interesting point. Um, it, it sounds easy enough for that to be redistributed in a sense. Technically, I'm not too sure. Uh, I don't have the knowledge of that. But aren't we looking at a deeper problem that uh, the UK is suffering from? And that is that it's not the manufacturing type uh, country that it used to be. And a lot of the services, especially in London, are focused on the financial services, for example. Is that one of the things that is ailing the UK as a whole? Uh, well, I would say the fact that Britain can no longer compete in the world when it comes to manufacturing, when you have China, India, Pakistan, and other subcontinent uh, countries that can perform and uh, outbid, outbuild, and uh, in many cases, outprofit Britain. Uh, under Margaret Thatcher, the coal industry was killed off, the uh, steel industry was killed off, uh, the trade union movement was decimated. Uh, and yes, Britain now is more a service country. Uh, the money does come in and out of the city of London, the financial sector. But that's all speculation. That's all shares. That's all people uh, betting on where the economy is going to go, where interest rates are going to go. Uh, so there is no manufacturing base and places like the north of England have been totally devastated. But that doesn't mean, I mean, Lambert said it's the sixth largest, sixth richest economy in the world. You can't tell me that there are multi-billionaires and yet you can't have money for an adequate health service or teach children in schools or give them school dinners because uh, austerity is a political choice. It is not an economic necessity. Therefore, all these policies are choices by the government. They are the wrong choices for the poor and they are the right charges for the rich. And that's why we see inequality grow day by day and hour by hour in one of the largest economies in the world. Uh, one of the things that's very worrisome, uh, given the uh, economic climate, not just for the UK, Frau Hughes, I'm sure you're aware of other European countries that are suffering um, in their uh, economies in one way or another, but when you take a look at the poor, they're the ones uh, that are obviously going to suffer more. Now, uh, Jeremy Hunt has promised, based on uh, what he has unveiled, that uh, public services is not, is not going to be affected as much. Uh, he has provided funds for it. But when uh, push comes to shove and the money has to be spent, there's got to be uh, projections and tax cuts that are involved in that uh, speculation, which then uh, the, uh, many are hoping to translate into reality. Do you think that public services are going to take a hit and not uh, reap any benefits that is being promised at this point? Well, every government claims that it puts more money into the health service than the previous government. But say you put in one billion, just to pick a random figure, if you say, well, we put in one billion point one million into the health service, which is more than the previous government, when you take in the rise in the cost of services, of drugs, of pharmaceuticals, of uh, prosthesis that are used in surgery, and the rise in cost in patient transport, uh, wages for nurses and doctors when eventually they get pay raises. In real terms, this means all those public services are being decimated uh, again day by day and hour by hour. They're falling by the wayside. And I wouldn't believe a word James Hunt said. I wouldn't believe a word Rishi Sunak said. I am old enough to have realized that these people are just sound bites who say something for 30 seconds or 60 seconds on the television in order to appease the public. They are giving, uh, I think it's every home in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, £400 to defer against the energy costs. But instead of capping the energy rate, they are allowing that to continue, although they, they will reduce it until April next year. What they are doing is subsidizing, yet again, private profit from energy companies with public money. And they are giving people money to appease the public so that there are not major rats on the streets of Britain, which is a distinct possibility when you see what's happening in the rest of Europe. But as I say, without nationalizing the energy companies, it will be very difficult to, to help the people who are most affected by this 
downturn in the economy, economy raising rates, and the fact that uh, the people who can least afford this are going to be hardest hit. And again, I don't think that the uh, government cares much for those people because uh, quite a few of them don't vote for the Conservative Party and none of them are donors. Okay. Uh, Lepidopic is back with us. Uh, Lepidopic, uh, I'm still trying to get over the Fra Hughes uh, stat on how there are more food banks than McDonald's, but uh, this particular um, example, I think, is something that needs to be highlighted where uh, it's... Uh, a new source it claims to be of economic anxiety in the UK, and that is uh, mortgages and how after more than a decade of, I guess, low interest rates, uh, people in the UK are suffering from, new homeowners especially, are suffering from the interest rate hikes, where one particular example, uh, this particular person said she bought her first home, a one-bedroom in Croydon in South London, and then a year and a half later, she is bracing for a nearly 80% jump in her monthly mortgage payments? I mean, is that what we're looking at? And how can people then afford their mortgages? Uh, yes, Paul, dear Bob. I'm sorry I've got some very bad regional problems tonight. Maybe this is an indication of the state of the United Kingdom. Uh, but the serious point you're making here is right. People's uh, cost of living isn't going up by 80%. It can be going up by 200%. Many people have fixed rate mortgages at 1.7%. You don't have to understand the, the mathematics here, but if, you, if I say that they've gone up 6%, you can understand that it's gone up three times since uh, they got their mortgage. So if they were paying £500 a month in the past, they'll be paying £1,500 a month. Then you add the fact that they're going to be paying maybe £2,000 a year extra in terms of their, their energy costs, and the food has gone up by a couple of thousand pounds. Britain is bankrupt. We're insolvent. And this is the second, the sixth biggest country in the world, used to claim to be the second fastest growing or the fastest growing. Uh, everything that my colleague there has said is right. At the end of the day, we're in a situation where we are in crisis Britain, not promised in Britain. And Rishi Sunak has approved an increase in taxes, which will hurt the poor the most. Where do we go from here? Well, there's nothing wrong with the situation that a miracle wouldn't fix. But that's what it will take to get Britain out of its current mess. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Lempidopic, uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, former member of the British Parliament there talking to us from London. And I'm going to come to you now, Farah Hughes, uh, with uh, what the Bank of England has warned that the UK is facing its longest recession on record and uh, economic downturn is expected to extend well into 2024. Now, uh, the rising interest rates is one of the reasons... Uh, that uh, is a double-edged sword because you have to tame inflation. But at the same time, when you have the interest rates rise, you can't give out, I mean, you can give out loans, but the, the high, higher rate uh, dissuades, uh, you know, is not that attractive for people to take out, whether it's for businesses, homes, et cetera. Um, are, are, are we looking at a downturn that, that's predicted that this new budget can then face with this type of stat coming out from the Bank of England based on what they've presented? Well, I don't think the budget that's being put forward is in any way going to have an effect, in my mind, for the interest rates going forward. Uh, you know, a, a, a lot of this is this recession that's going to go on to 2024. We've all been here before. It's a capitalist boom and bust system. Even the Bible said there were seven years of lean and seven years of fat. If you take the uh, financial crisis of 2008, which was brought about by the deregulation of the banks, that's why that came about. Uh, there was no kind of uh, fiscal pressure put on the banks and they just kind of ran away with people's money and ran away with their own ideas of how to create more profit. You're right, it's a catch-22. Whenever interest rates go up, then the cost of borrowing becomes more expensive. Therefore, businesses that are in trouble won't be able to get access to more finance. People who are considering opening a business or starting a business won't have access to the finance because they won't be able in the short term to pay back the high repayments. Then you have mortgages that may default and people could possibly become homeless and their houses seized and people put out onto the streets. But for my mind, and I'm not an economist, but I believe a lot of this is just pure uh, profiteering from the companies. The profiteering from the energy sector, the profiteering from the food sector, the profiteering from everything and everywhere and everyone. They're just all these companies and corporations 
using the excuse of inflation and the war in Ukraine to just stick their arm into the public purse and stick their arms into the pockets of the members of the public in order to make obscene profits. So if they stopped, if they found a way to stop this uh, obscene profiteering, then there wouldn't be a need to increase interest rates. The reason why so much money is being spent in society right now is because everything has gone up in price, and a lot of people will be spending their savings just to stand still. So by increasing interest rates in order to slow down the amount of money that's being spent in the economy, right. the okay. correct way to do that is to stop the profiteering. Yeah, I wish we had come up uh, with this point earlier because uh, what you're saying then is they're taking advantage of the situation uh, for whatever uh, they can come up with, whether it's broken uh, supply chains or what have you. Too bad we just don't have the time. But thank you very much for that. Fra Hughes, journalist, author, and activist. And uh, for, uh, we had Lempit Opic with us prior, former member of the British Parliament from London. With that, we come to an end for this edition of the Spotlight. From Mikhail Tathway, it's goodbye.